Good morning. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the invitation to speak today. I get to start the morning off by talking to you about serendipity. What a wonderful word, so much fun to say. Serendipity is um, the aptitude for making fortunate discoveries by mistake. The word was coined 250 years ago by Horace Walpole, who was then the Earl of Oxford. He read what he called a silly fairy tale about the three princes of Serendip. While their highnesses were traveling around, they were forever making fortunate discoveries by accident and sagacity of things that they weren't even in quest for. We have to ask, can we believe that important things, even the most important things, could be discovered by accident? Well, in science, this happens so often that it's started to become a cliche. You probably owe your very life to the accidental discovery of the first antibiotic by Alexander Fleming. Fleming was a, a medical researcher, and he was looking for substances that kill bacteria. So why is this an example of serendipity? Well, he went away on vacation. And as he was away, all of the plates on which his bacteria had been plated were thrown away. When he came back, he found out that they hadn't been disinfected the way they were supposed to be, so he had to throw them away again. And as he was going through them, throwing them away, he noticed something odd. On one of the plates, a mold was growing. And around the mold, the bacteria had all died. Now, this mold was probably an accidental contaminant from the, the lab of a friend of his. All right? And so he isolated the substance from that mold, uh, and the mold was a penicillium mold. And he called the substance penicillin. So you can call that chance, but Louis Pasteur said chance favors the prepared mind. So instead, let's call it serendipity. Lots of other things have been discovered by serendipity. The uh, antipsychotic, chlorpromazine, the anti-cancer agent, cisplatin, uh, the anesthetic, laughing gas. Um, an awful lot of artificial sweeteners, like cyclamates and saccharin and aspartame, have been discovered in the laboratory when a researcher licked his fingers to turn a notebook page in the laboratory and discovered that it tasted sweet. I know. <laughs> so, um, dyes for clothing have been looked for for as often, for as long as people have been wearing clothes. And blues and purples have been among the hardest to find. Um, purple was so rare for a long time that only kings wore it because it was so expensive. Well, in a, in a recently reported serendipitous discovery, there were some researchers who were looking at manganese oxides. And the primary investigator reported that one day he was walking along and one of the graduate students had pulled something out of a furnace and it was bright, vivid blue. And uh, the researcher reported that at about 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit, this otherwise completely innocuous manganese oxide turned into a environmentally benign, stable, and very cheap blue pigment. All right, probably the best new blue dye that it has yet been discovered. Um, Teflon, superglue, rayon, safety glass, Velcro were all discovered pretty much by accident. Um, oh, here we go. How did we ever live without post-it notes? <laughs> all right, doubly serendipitous. The adhesive was discovered by um, Spencer Silver, the 3M Corporation in 1968, but they had no idea what to do with it. Six years later, six years, Art Fry came along, and what he needed was a removable bookmark that he could use in his church hymnal, all right? And thus became uh, post-it notes. So not just scientists, but businessmen and psychologists say that serendipity is really important in human life. In Psychology Today last year, Rebecca uh, Weber said that we have to allow serendipity to happen to us. We should make our own luck. And she said there are a couple things that you can look for. You can try and be flexible and open to new people and new situations. And in fact, uh, Richard Wiseman, a psychologist from the University of Herefordshire, did an experiment on this. He wrote a book called The Luck Factor. All right? 
And what he did was he took situations, he set up situations, and then allowed people who either characterized themselves as unlucky or lucky to walk into them and see what happened. So the unlucky person would walk right over cash on the ground, but the lucky person automatically scooped it right up, put it in his pocket. If there was a connected businessman sitting in a cafe, the unlucky person would sit there sipping a cup of coffee, never even talking to him. But the lucky person would start up a conversation and thus make the connection that could lead them to something good. In addition, um, Weber said that we should allow ourselves to slack off when we need to. A local business calls this the 80-20 rule. Spend 80% of your time doing your job and 20% of your time thinking about how to do your job better. And the final thing that she said is that we need to allow ourselves to fail. And I'm gonna talk a lot more about that in a minute. But so apologies to American idols lead to wise. Sweet serendipity is not dumb luck, all right? It's not landing on my feet in the nick of time and by the skin of my teeth. Instead, as John Barth put it in The Last Voyage of Somebody, the Sailor, you don't reach serendip by plotting a course for it. You have to set out in good faith for elsewhere and lose your bearings serendipitously. So this leads me to a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. Why is research important? As a scientist with a background in medical research, I am always being asked, why don't we have a cure for X disease, for AIDS or for cancer or for something else? Or the corollary question, when will we have a cure for, for that disease? Just as often, somebody will say something like, oh, those darn ivory tower academics wasting money on silly research, all right? So here's the basic understanding which is so frustrating. We often talk about research and development together, like the Department of R&D or R&D spending. These are two completely different things. Development is driven by profit motive. It has as its goal taking a known product and moving it to market to make money. Research, on the other hand, is trying to find out something new with the idea of advancing a field or an industry or the whole human race. So we don't have a cure for X disease, AIDS, because we don't know how to do it yet. And we won't know how until some silly scientist does some silly research and discovers the accident, the, the, uh, the cure by serendipity, accidentally. So why isn't the research done? It's expensive. It takes specialized facilities. It takes people who are smart and well-educated and more dedicated to discovering new things than they are to making money. Because research doesn't pay off right away. It always pays off in the end. The Lasker Foundation has shown that for every dollar that we spend on silly basic research, we get back between 10 and $80 in reduced illness, healthcare costs, and productivity uh, due to longer life. So I like the idea of serendipity not just in general, but uh, I use it in my own life. When I'm, I'm working on a new problem, really of any sort, there's a five-step process that I go through that moves me in some direction. Sometimes it moves me forward. And the process that I'll talk about more is learn more, think more, but re be ready to think sideways, reach out, and embrace the unexpected. So one part of the foundation of knowledge of finding serendipity is knowing what's already been learned. So uh, when we review grants, for example, for the National Science Foundation, we spend a lot of time finding out whether or not the proposers have spent some time learning what's already been done. And unlike what you think, this is not to keep them from reinventing the wheel. It's to keep them from spending public funds to reinvent the flat tire. <laughs> One problem is that we keep ourselves so busy that we rarely have time to think, all right? Eventually, as researchers, that's our job. Our job is to think. Our bosses think our job is to go to meetings. But really, what we need to do is spend time just pondering. Um, turn off your phone and that little annoying thing that says new email on your computer, all right, and think. I know Peter had some worries about uh, whether I was ever gonna get this talk done. I had some distractions this summer. Uh, a month ago, I had melanoma. As of uh, a week ago last Friday, my doctors say I don't anymore. So thank you, medical research.
Anyway, I do my best thinking over long periods of time. He was right to encourage us to, to start early. We, make our, we made our outline months ago. And while uh, other things were happening in my life, my subconscious was busy writing this speech for me. Right? I often do that, start early and allow things to percolate through until finally, at the very end, uh, in this case about two weeks ago, the entire thing comes together in my mind. Uh, anyway, Peter, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> so I'm grateful to the college th that we're standing in today for putting me on sabbatical this semester. I'm teaching half time and half time I'm working at a local chemical company. Because I have a more relaxed schedule, I have a lot more time to think. And I'm finding a lot of things that I probably should have known several years ago uh, are becoming more apparent to me now as I, as I have a chance to think about them. It's also interesting to me that I'm not at my most creative while I'm sitting at my desk forcing myself to think, all right? I do a lot of my best thinking sideways, maybe when I'm exercising, all right? When I'm out walking or riding my bike, all right, I'm not busy answering the phone, I'm not surfing the internet, and all parts of my mind get to come together and work on problems, and that includes my subconscious. Um, I do my best songwriting while I'm out riding my bicycle. All right, I'll ride along, work on a verse, and then stop every once in a while. I don't do this while I'm writing, I stop, and then sing the verse into my phone and record it. Uh, a couple years ago, I was on a long distance bike ride, uh, and uh, I was writing a song in my mind, and I looked up and all of a sudden, I had no idea where I was. There wasn't another bike rider to be seen, uh, <laughs> and I fortunately had my cell phone to call my buddy on the course and say, where am I? <laughs> you know, and he said, I don't know, where are you? But he helped me find my way back onto the course. Um, and, and we need to reach out. We need to reach out to others because great new discoveries are made at the interface between people and disciplines. All right, I have an example from my own previous research experience. Um, like many scientists, I have a favorite paper. Now, this isn't the most cited paper, and uh, this one was published in kind of an obscure journal. Um, but what we were doing was we were immunizing people who are HIV infected with HIV vaccines to see if we could jumpstart their immune system, and my job was to look at the antibodies that they were getting that were against the vaccine rather than the ones that they had against their own disease. And the way we were doing that was we were making peptides. Peptides are little tiny proteins, and we made the entire sequence of the vaccinating protein in these little peptides, and I was supposed to look to see what antibodies they were making directed against the vaccine. Now, the thing about this was in short order, we were overwhelmed by the data because we had maybe a dozen time points and hundreds of peptides and hundreds of patients, and when we put all that together, by the end of the story, we had something like two million pieces of data, and it was really difficult to try and call something interesting from that, but we couldn't do it. Until one day, I was talking to an astrophysicist who's married to a friend of mine. Uh, Rick, who was actually an astrophysicist, his job was to try and make some sense of the cosmic background radiation. Now, you may have read about this because his boss got the Nobel Prize for this a couple years ago. He was using a statistical method for this that worked beautifully on the data that we were looking at as well. That led to the publication of the paper that I like so much and probably the broadest first author line of any paper that I've ever been on. We were able to use this technique to find the specific immune responses against HIV and we were eventually able to use that in children who were infected with HIV, in other HIV vaccines, and then even in other diseases like hepatitis C. This allows us to tease out those specific immune responses that may be helpful in diseases that we've been having trouble developing new vaccines for, like influenza or the common cold or, or HIV. Arriving at the island of Serendip does you no good if you get there and then turn around because it wasn't your destination. How often do you think that uh, somebody sees something unusual like a mold growing in his experiment and then just throws it away because he doesn't have the time to deal with that? So one of the things that we have to let ourselves do is discover new things. In the project lab here at school, what my students are working on is making biodiesel fuel from waste vegetable oil. That's what we start with, fry oil, pretty nasty stuff. And at the end, we have this beautiful biodiesel. But one day, we let the reaction get away from us. We mixed our ingredients and we let it get too hot, and the next thing we knew, we had biodiesel jello. <laughs> Don't do this at home, kids. My students called this the worst biodiesel ever, but we didn't throw it away. And I had an intern this summer, Tracy, and she wanted to see if she could get something back out of this, and she never got any fuel out of it, but what she did get was a new surfactant. That's a soap to those of us outside of the laboratory. And this surfactant has an unusual property 
it's uh, liquid at room temperature, but when you heat it up, it solidifies. So it's reversible, okay? Liquid at room temperature and you heat it up and it gets solid. Now, that turns out not to be that unusual in the world of surfactants, but none of us knew that before we did this experiment. It was something completely new to all of us. So that was a, an example of serendipity in our laboratory. Can we help our students do this? Can we help them embrace serendipity, all right? Normally what we do is we learn more, okay? But that's just the start. We let them do long projects, all right? And so that's good. Um, we encourage them to reach out, talk to others. My students have Facebook pages that help them uh, work overcome, I was gonna say overcome the laboratory reports that I give them, all right? Um, the one thing that we do so poorly, we do this so poorly in teaching science, which is allowing them to embrace the unexpected. How can they? Every lab has a known outcome. So what we have to do is throw things in their pathway that they don't know the answer to, all right? These are expensive. These experiments are, are very expensive in dollars and time. But if we don't do that, we don't allow science students to become scientists. So one of the things that we do in our laboratory is we allow students to bring in a plant, all right? And then we sequence an unknown gene from that plant. So for example, this last semester, my students sequenced a gene, the gap VH gene, from Nepetocotoria, that's otherwise known as catnip. All right, well, it doesn't sound that exciting, but it took them all semester, and they were the first to accomplish this, the first ever, right? So they learned along the way that you can make mistakes. Not everything worked. Sometimes they would find a new way of doing things that was better than in the published protocol. So they were in the process of embracing the unexpected and letting serendipity work for them. The best thing we do along these lines is the project lab where the students work on the biodiesel. This green fuels lab, which has been pioneered by Dr. Kiner, who will be a speaker later on today, allows them to work on science that nobody knows the answer to, limited only by their own imagination. Well, as I'm getting ready to finish, Peter asked me to do one more thing. Uh, he, he asked if, if I could uh, somehow relate this to my parenting style. <laughs> so, uh, my wife, who is a, an attorney, and I uh, are shockingly kind of type A uh, success-oriented people. So we found that our best parenting is done when we just relax a little bit. All right, so uh, these are my two sons. Um, so we encourage our boys to try everything and not worry too much about whether or not they're successful at it. Uh, my older son, for example, liked art. Neither my wife nor I are artists of any sort, but we encourage them to take art classes, go for it. If that's what you want to do, go for it, all right? So uh, he did, and he sold his first painting, the first of many, four years ago. Uh, he currently has art on exhibit at the United Nations as part of a global art competition, all right, from two non-artist parents. Uh, the other one, more traditionally, um, thinks that he might be an engineer. How did we know he might be an engineer? He constructed a scale model race car and a working drum kit from items he found in our recycling bin. <laughs> so for his birthday, we gave him six rolls of duct tape. <laughs> he currently wants to make rocket fuel from styrofoam. I'm not sure how the duct tape plays into that, but someday maybe it will. Uh, as I close, I'd, I'd like to thank Peter for inviting me, the school for putting me on sabbatical this semester so I have time to do fun things like this, uh, my family for supporting my efforts, uh, academic and, and personal, and you for, for paying so good attention. Thank you. Thank you. I have, I have some questions for you. <laughs> okay. Sitting back there listening to you talk about the experiment in which the dollar bills were laid out in front of somebody. Yes and also meeting somebody at a cafe. I can't help thinking that extroverts have an advantage over introverts. Uh, well, I'm an introvert. So am I. Okay, I'm an introvert, and I never miss money on the floor. I mean, I'll walk <laughs> over, you know, there's a penny underneath that chair, I'm gonna be getting that later on, okay? So that one's mine. Is introversion and being a skinflint help? Yes, <laughs> maybe. Um, I, I, in terms of meeting other people, mm -hmm. this is one of the things that we have to teach our students. Mm -hmm. You can be an extrovert and still meet new people. All right, it just takes a little bit more energy to I mean, do introverts, that. Introverts, introverts, inter I'm sorry, introverts. It's harder for us to meet people because it, uh, it takes more energy to do that, yeah. but it's energy well spent. So you have to force yourself. It's part of your class. Go meet people, all right? So you know, also, assignment. your quote about setting out in earnest in one direction and then being open to being diverted. Right. But what if you try to game the system and say, 
I am going to expect to get lost as I pursue path B. Does that count, or is, it, or is that <laughs> not really part of the game? Uh, the, the problem with that is unless you're independently wealthy, nobody will pay you to get lost. Uh, <laughs> I've been told to get lost many times. I'm not independently wealthy. But if you have a good boss, and I, I try to be one, um, when you have somebody who's supposed to be distilling methanol for us to use that in an experiment, and instead what she discovers is a new soap, you let her spend her time working on the new soap and not all her time just making methanol for the rest of the laboratory. Now that brings up another point, which is how do we scale serendipity? Right now it sounds very elusive, privy to those few people. How do we scale this so every young person or old person gets to use it? Because when you describe, you gotta think sideways, you gotta slack off, you gotta fail. I'll tell you, Larry, <laughs> I worked for six major employers in my lifetime. None of those six were those part of the code of ethics or value statements. <laughs> I mean, my first employer, which shall remain nameless, they had a motto which goes like this, to err is human, to forgive divine, and neither is the company policy. <laughs> so, so how do we scale serendipity and that kind of corporate milieu? Right. Okay, uh, I, am, I fortunately, as my first academic experience, or sorry, my first work experience post-academia, worked at the DuPont Experimental Research Station. And their job was to find new stuff. So they would put you in the laboratory and say, you're working on polymers. Well, what am I supposed to do? You tell us. Wow. All right? And so places like that, think tanks, where the idea is to take smart people and say, go find something, are the ones that, that really move society forward. The rest are doing the development work and, and moving things to market. But the new discoveries are made by by accident. And so companies, uh, normally what they'll do is hopefully set aside some resources for that. And the, the quote I gave you earlier was from a local company where they said, 80% of your time doing your job, 20% of your time thinking about how to do it better. So some companies have that policy and hopefully they'll be the successful companies. So you've given us a recipe for scaling serendipity at the home as a parent, but also at the workplace, right. and maybe also as a, as a society. You all will allow us to scale serendipity up to as a society. The next time somebody says, are you gonna pay for this bill, all right? Don't vote against it unless you really know what's going on, okay? Just because you don't understand it does not mean it's a stupid idea. Thank you, thank, thank you, Larry. You.